session. I would like to invite everybody watching the live stream to also join me in the Q&A session. Some of you may have already scanned the QR code, but if you haven't, uh, you can go to slido.com. That's S-L-I-D-O.com. Uh, and slido.com and enter uh, the numbers 00617. So 00 and 617, that's today's date at slido.com. So whether if you scan the QR code or whether if you uh, are online, you can enter the questions and vote on each other's questions. Exactly like this. And um, as people have asked me questions, I will highlight them and the highlighted questions will become the topic of discussion. And after answering one question, uh, I will just archive it and take it down and so that we can keep uh, interacting this way. But people raising your hand on, on this room, of course, have precedence, have priority over the online uh, questions. So feel free to start asking questions now um, during my talk and just use the Slido platform to like each other's questions. Okay, so that was like the two minute uh, beginning. Let's switch back to my slides, please. Um, can I have my PowerPoint? Uh, so go back to the PowerPoint. Yeah. All right. So um, my talk today is about finding facts in a world of disinformation, the search of collective solutions, and the emphasis on the collective. In open societies, everybody across different sectors have different roles to play. The government providing a safe and secure communication environment, the journalist providing um, investigations into what the facts are, and the civil society working on different issues, uh, focusing on solving the issues in a way given different positions uh, to find out common values. But this information crisis is a global threat to open societies exactly because it makes it very difficult to, for people to tell what facts are and participate in the collective fact-finding process. And in Taiwan, uh, we don't uh, say fake news because uh, in the Mandarin uh, that we speak, uh, journalist Xinwen uh, Gongzuo or Xinwen Gongzuo Zhe uh, is literally news worker. So news worker, Xinwen Gongzuo, right? So we have the same word for news and journalism, essentially. So when we say fake news in Taiwan, it feels like uh, you know, accusing the journalist of producing bad journalism. Uh, it's very different uh, from, of course, things that pretends to be journalism, but really isn't, and misleading titles and, so, and all that. So when we say jia uh, xinwen or fake news in, in Mandarin, it's very unclear what is meant, uh, and it feels like a assault uh, on journalism. And because of my mother, and father were all uh, journalists, and because of filial piety, <laughs> I have to uh, pay, pay respect to them, so I, I, I don't say jia xinwen. So in, in Taiwan, we say jia xunxi, or disinformation. And disinformation in Taiwan, we have a legal definition for disinformation. It's not just a communication word, there's a legal definition, and it's called intentional harmful untruth. And the harmful here is qualified to say, basically, harming the public, harming the public's ability to discover facts together, harming the democracy. It's not just harming the image of a minister, that's just good journalism, right? So it has to harm the public, uh, and it has to be intentional, it has to be untrue, and that is the basis of our legal definition of disinformation. Now, when we're tackling this information, we need to be very clear that Taiwan's core values are freedom of expression and the openness of society. According to the Human Rights Watch organization, Civicus Monitor, Taiwan is the only totally open uh, jurisdiction in this part of the world, actually all the way to Africa. And that is because whenever we see things like the disinformation crisis, we see it as an invitation for the sectors to work closer together instead of driving us apart. If we drive us apart, then there's a strong um, attraction for the government to, in, uh, to infringe the freedom of expression using that as excuse, as we have seen in some jurisdictions. But in Taiwan, we always use it as an invitation to make the society even more free and open. Now, um, I would like to uh, explain our three methodologies to counter this information. Uh, and uh, the first one is called timely response. On average, across all the ministries in Taiwan, 
whenever we detect a raising misinformation, it may not be intentional, it could be just a rumor, but if it's a rumor, it's not clarified within an hour, within the same news cycle, then the people who are intentional just manufacture this information out of it. So this one hour window is very, very important. When we see a raising rumor or misinformation, all the ministries are now equipped with dedicated teams to contribute our understanding of the context to the popular media in a way that is attractive, that is fun uh, within one hour so that people can tell uh, the differences between the government message that is, has the full context versus a gossip which often lacks full context. But we're not taking anything down, right? We were just sharing our view of the world in a very timely fashion. So just use one example. Um, and this is a funny one because this is our premier, uh, our prime minister. Uh, so two photos of him. The larger one is when he was young and the smaller one is uh, he is now. Uh, so he is now bald, uh, but he has more hair uh, in his youth. Right, so basically um, the top says there's a popular rumor now. And the rumor is quoted saying, perming your hair will be subject to a fine of one million NT dollars starting next week which is ridiculous, right? But we detect that it's been spreading. Uh, and so it says, not true. And then the quote of a younger prime minister said, I may be bald now, but I will not punish people with hair. So it's very funny. Um, and <laughs> there's a smaller uh, sentence that says, what we have actually done is that by 2021, we're requiring the people who make perming and dyeing products to start labeling the ingredients in their uh, hair products. That's all the government's uh, policy. And it's very easy to communicate in just one sentence. But if you start with that sentence, nobody wants to read it, right? So you have to frame it in a way that's funny, right? And I didn't translate that to English, but uh, the last part, the, the bald prime minister, well, what he's saying, the premier is saying here is that but if you keep perming your hair many times in a week, your hair will fall off and become like me. So, <laughs> so it's, a, it's a humorous uh, at the expense of himself. <laughs> and it reached many, many people, right? Many people really just uh, organically share these pictures just by the Facebook and Twitter and Lions accounts alone. It reached uh, to a massive amount of people. So that people become kind of inoculated. They still see the rumor afterwards, but their uh, mind is already inoculated against the very existence of such a rumor. And we discovered that if we push this out within one hour, then it reached a balance. But if we only uh, push it after 24 hours, then it's impossible. The rumor will already have reached everybody. So time is of the utmost importance here. The next thing, uh, the uh, second of the three, uh, prong of um, countering disinformation is collaborative checking. So in Taiwan, the civil society, the social sector, uh, there's a civic tech movement called Gov Zero or G Zero V. Basically, the social sector looks at all the government services that they find missing or bad or badly delivered. And because all the government services end in gov.tw, so people in the social sector just register the same website, but with something that g0v.tw. So if you change the O to a zero, you get into the shadow government uh, that is done by the social sector. And so that is how people fork, meaning that taking the government to a different direction, but it's always open source and free of uh, copyright or patent uh, restrictions. And so uh, the people in the GovZero community developed this co-fact collaborative checking. It's like a wiki, Wikipedia, where everybody can contribute that collectively identify the popular rumors. And they work with the international fact-checking network through the Taiwan fact-checking center. And so this is a popular line bot. At the moment, I think 100,000 people have added a bot called Kofax as a friend online. So the way it works is that oftentimes the disinformation works by provoking outrage, right? You see a picture, uh, you, you, you think that you have to forward it out, right? So it basically says if you feel the urge of forwarding a, a um, rumor or misinformation, you can forward to the robot. The robot will not get upset, but the robot will rather go back to you and say whether this is actually clarified or not, whether it is this information or not. And all the clarification message is crowdsourced, meaning that people actually meet every week uh, and uh, talk um, in a way that is very friendly among the fact checkers. And anyone is welcome to join. There's food, uh, there's uh, excellent uh, drinks and things like that. So it makes this information a, a interesting topic, just like uh, people 
people talk about their favorite Pokemon, right? They may talk about their favorite disinformation campaign of the month uh, and contribute into uh, clarifying it on a shared database. And this then connects to the Taiwan Fact Check Center, which is part of the International Fact Checking Network that looks at the most popular flagged rumors on the COFAC network and then do a thorough investigative reporting style uh, clarification report on it. And that is our second line of defense that is from the social sector. And so uh, Line, the, the company, of course, took notice into this and actually uh, supported a lot the social sector's work of essentially just like you can flag a email as spam, you can now very easily flag a incoming line message as potential misinformation or disinformation. So that's our uh, second line of defense. Our third line of defense then is election and referendum law because the payoff is especially strong during the election season, right? So uh, we see that there's a lot of people who want to influence through precision targeting on social media, through all the sort of uh, political advertisement. And because Taiwan has one of the most transparent campaign donation law anywhere in the world, we publish using machine readable format, like a database or Excel spreadsheets, each and every campaign donation to a uh, election campaign. So in a previous election, we have witnessed that people who uh, maybe have, you know, influences uh, on election using money, they prefer to go through advertisements rather than campaign donation because this is too, too transparent for them. Uh, but now we're uh, not actually uh, refraining from just saying starting next election, advertisements are going to be treated as campaign donations. All the advertisers are then required to disclose the funding source of their, uh, regardless of whether they're institutional media, social media, paper media, or whatever, disclose the source of the funding. And it's like anti-money laundering. Every uh, part have to reveal their true funding uh, that sponsors them. And if any of them tracks to a external um, jurisdiction, then uh, it's actually, um, of course, election interference then. And so this is our third line of defense, and it takes effect only during election and making it a crime uh, if there's a foreign sponsored propaganda to do so. Um, and so again, we rely on independent media. There's many independent media uh, in Taiwan uh, that just looks at the campaign donation records and very uh, soon uh, the political advertisement records and do a thorough uh, media charting relationship finding all the different connections and so on. And it's the greatest thing about those independent media is that they all work collaboratively on GitHub, which is a website the open source um, developers use, uh, now sponsored by Microsoft. But in any case, <laughs> what GitHub is doing is that it makes sure that the methodology, the tools that you make to make those analysis is by itself can be verified. If somebody makes a mistake in making the charts or things like that, everybody in the social sector can come in and look at it and find out uh, what is the actually the best way to present in a fair fashion the political contributions, whether it's campaign donation or advertisement. So again, independent journalism that talks collectively to the social sector is of utmost importance. Now I talked about three defense. Now I want to talk about three proactive actions that we are also doing. So one of the proactive action is actually just open government. Um, I'm a minister um, that uh, across all the different ministries, and I can talk uh, about any ministry's issues as long as 5,000 people petition online to talk about it. So we actually travel to you if you can get 5,000 signatures online. And we have a team in each ministry to talk to people who petition even for cross-ministerial uh, matters. And I personally, this is my office by the way, uh, I personally in the office uh, in the Social Innovation Lab in Taipei City provide office hours. So every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. anyone can come and talk to me for 40 minutes. Uh, I'm very uh, easily reachable on Twitter and so on, and so anyone can really have a real conversation and ask what, what are things going. And what I have found that it is much easier if we explain the why of policy making, the context of policy making, instead of just policies. And so every meetings I chair, even internally, I publish the entire transcript after two weeks of co-editing of all the meeting participants. <clears throat> and so everybody uh, can go to the 
website. And the address is archive, A-R-C-H-I-V-E, archive.tw, and see that since I become the digital minister, I have talked to 4,000 people on about 200,000 speeches, and it, everything is transcribed just like uh, the legislative and the judicial branches. And the great thing about that is that then people don't have to explain the same thing twice. Everybody can see the context of policy making that reduces the rumors and the budget and everything is also open for everybody to have a conversation about. Now, the second line of proactive action is that we work uh, with the popular messaging companies. Uh, line, I think, is also pretty popular here, and they just announced that they're uh, part of the digital accountability uh, best practice. So they're starting next month, I believe. They will take the COFACT bot and the Taiwan Fact Checking bot and um, two other bots, the, the four um, social sector uh, clarifications, and built it in into its own product so that everybody can just very easily loan tap or uh, signal a message and send a message into the fact checkers. And so you don't have to manually add COFAC as your friends. Uh, Line will facilitate that by having a function in itself. And Line also, many of you maybe know, that has a separate section called Line Today, right? It's like its own small media. Uh, and in Line Today, there will be a special column uh, just for popular clarifications. And so uh, people can go to Line Today and see what the trend uh, clarification is basically making clarification a, a fun media message that people can just proactively check before uh, they see the disinformation uh, on their end-to-end -end encryption and the great thing about this is that the state doesn't have to read your end-to-end -end encrypted message because it's technologically um, not good to do so right it's just a rumors right but when people uh, start suspecting that there is a disinformation campaign going on they can just flag it directly online messaging and for the clarifications from the independent fact checkers to appear online today. And so that is our second uh, active contribution. So this is our president, uh, Dr. Tsai ing uh, talking to the line bear. <coughs> so I have two uh, more minutes and then we go to questions. So I think uh, the third thing is that we also use public funding to uh, film a series of very impactful and highly acclaimed, uh, I think it's 95% uh, on IMDB and even higher domestically, uh, a TV series. And a TV series called The World Between Us talks about how the media framing works, talks about how people uh, in the media and doing journalism is uh, um, caught between the need of real-time uh, reporting and the racing against um, the tabloids and gossiping and things like that, difficulty of doing proper investigative journalism, uh, the, the usual framing of social issues into controversies and things like that, and it's really, really uh, well made. Uh, it's uh, supported by public money uh, in the public television, and it's very popular. And after that, the discussion around media literacy become much easier, and so, so much so that starting this August August, we're making into our K-12 curriculum. So starting from the first grade, from the primary school, the students will learn about critical thinking and media literacy, not as a class, not as two hours every week, but across all the different classes. We have handouts uh, to the, all the different teachers, whether you're teaching geography, mathematics, or sociology, or whatever. You can work with the um, kids on how to discover independent information online, and also on doing the media literacy, referencing the public television uh, into uh, the idea of a collective understanding. So this is uh, the film, uh, The World uh, Between Us. It's 10 TV series. Um, it's, it's really good. It was 10 episodes. So um, I hope that someday it gets translated here. And so just to recap very quickly, uh, basically uh, you will understand that I see the disinformation uh, through an epidemic uh, uh, metaphor. And I personally have worked uh, back 20 years ago uh, in uh, working to counter spam and junk email. So I see it in a very similar uh, situation. Uh, the spam and junk mail was solved not only by government regulation or infringing on free speech, but rather by everybody like Gmail and Outlook, Hotmail, everybody uh, agreeing to add a flag as spam button so that people can donate voluntarily junk mails to a spam house, to the domain blocking list, to all the different social sector endeavors so that we collectively understand the pattern of junk mail and do academic research on it so that we have facts about the disinformation. And this is the same direction that Taiwan is going. And uh, the public media, the social sector, everybody has a role to play in it. So that's my 20 minutes of contribution. And let's uh, switch to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Audrey Chang. 
Can you please join me yeah, in the course. middle of the stage? Or you like to take a look on smartphone at the same time? Thank you very much, Minister, for your enlightening us with what you have done. Can, can you just sure. move to the middle sure. of the stage? Yeah, and we have the <laughs> yes, yes. So what would you like me to do to ask you a question and integrate with the questions yeah, asking you? Whatever you would like to do. Okay, so let, let me flag up some questions. Okay. Yeah. You told us about uh, your channeling of conversation, talking with people, and you try to pave the way mm -hmm. to encourage mm -hmm. government, Taiwanese government, to have more conversation right. with citizens. Mm -hmm. How, how is it going and what's the most asked question in us authorization? Right, it, that's a great question. So um, I think the government is now um, having a lot more confidence, right? It used to be when we um, helped occupying the parliament in 2014 that people were very uh, afraid of talking to 5,000 citizens. Uh, they, they fear that it will escalate and they will get misquoted, that they will get a lot of burden just by talking to citizens. But now because the government itself has a system of, as I said, a radically transparent system of capturing the context of conversation, there is less fear about quoting out of context. There is less uncertainty because people uh, have already voted on each other's questions. Just like Slido, people are voting on each other's questions so that we only tackle the one with the most uh, consensus already among people. So we make sure that we don't waste our time answering a question that maybe only one person has, but rather focusing our energy on things that everybody cares about. And one of the most asked questions in our e-petition platform is about human rights. It's about how Taiwan can protect more uh, uh, the, the human rights, like the referendum law uh, that we just had a referendum, a real referendum. Uh, people have a e-petition that says, oh, uh, you shouldn't have a referendum that impinge on the minority's rights. And when we find a petitioner, uh, he is just 16 years old. Or uh, environment is also very popular. Uh, a couple of years ago, we have a very popular petition that says you, you should ban uh, plastic straws uh, in the takeout drinks and things like that. And it's reached 5,000 people very quickly. And then when we meet with the petitioner, she's again just 15 years old. Uh, and, uh, very young yeah, and, and caring about the plastic waste and things like that. And so I think the social justice and environment are the two most popular things. And does it turn out that you also encourage other ministers in the parliament to be joining in the conversation mm -hmm. and to respond to the questions from people directly? Yeah, very much so. I think that is why we have participation officers. So those are a team of people in each ministry in charge of uh, talking to their ministers and figuring out a way to talk directly with people in a way that responds to people's e-petitions and people's ideas and things like that. And it's working really well. Uh, we have many uh, ministries voluntarily sending people to my office to learn this art from me. It's not everybody, right? In Taiwan, we have 32 ministries. At the moment, I have 22 uh, colleagues, so not everybody. Uh, like the Ministry of Defense have not sent anyone yet. Uh, but, but the ministry that want to talk publicly and openly, like uh, culture, um, education, interior, mm -hmm. communication, uh, justice, finance, and so on, they all have sent people to my office. And would you say that this is leading to open government of Taiwanese mm -hmm. government of mm -hmm. what you have been doing? Yeah, I think so. I think open government is not just about the government being open about, uh, you know, getting ideas from the citizen, but fundamentally it's about trusting the people. If I trust the people, if people uh, generally feel the government trusts them on get, getting their input, then they can trust back, right? So the government has to trust the people first. That is the idea of open government in Taiwan. Yes. And one line of your speech, you said that perhaps the government is so afraid that mm -hmm. open society is mm -hmm. become threat mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how, mm -hmm. how does that sentiment mm -hmm. been reduced mm -hmm. after you've been doing this quite a while? That's right. So I think uh, if anyone here works in public service, um, so all, all my like uh, parents and grandparents actually work in public service, so I know something about how public servants think. Uh, so it's uh, roughly speaking three things, right? The people in public service uh, think about efficiency, how to make it uh, 
more efficient to deliver service to the people. People think about reducing risk of how to make sure that their ministers uh, don't get attacked <laughs> from the population by some uh, mistake in their, uh, in their policy. And finally, they also care about credit and personal honor, right? About doing the work greatly and getting recognized as great public servants. And before radical transparency, it's actually very difficult for the public service to truly innovate because if things go right, the minister can take all the credit. Mm -hmm. And if things go wrong, the minister can always blame the public service, right? So it's not in a very good position. <laughs> but after radical transparency and direct conversation, if things go right, everybody recognized, the journalists recognized the person who came up with the innovation and solution because it's part of the record. And if things go wrong, you can always blame Audrey. And so in this way, people are actually uh, encouraged to so open and transparency also yes. encourage to have more trust yes, it's, in it's the government. Yes, it's radical trust. That's right. Yes. So let's now integrate with the sure. live questions. Okay. The first one. Okay. What's your view on fighting fake news in our Asia style and mm -hmm. the Western mm -hmm. style? What's a difference? Okay, that's a great question. Um, I think uh, journalism uh, in uh, Asia and journalism in uh, the Western world don't have any fundamental differences. It's about collective discovery of facts. However, in Asia, uh, when, when we talk, for example, in, in Mandarin about uh, about consensus, uh, it is actually a, of a different nature. And that is, I think, the main difference. Um, in, in Mandarin means roughly uh, common understanding. So this is not something that is so strong, like a consensus you can sign your name on, but just something that is kind of we agree to disagree, but there's something we can all live with. There's a general, um, you know, l less violent uh, debate. So we talk about deliberate, we don't talk about debate, and we talk about finding our rough consensus, not very fine consensus, and so on. So we have a softer approach to consensus, and I think that helps, uh, the, for example, the COFAX uh, team, because in the COFAX social sector, of course, there are people of different political inclinations, different fields, different expertise, and so on. If, if they're seeking a very fine consensus, basically online, you know, the people with the most time wins, right? You can just keep trolling, right? But because what we're seeking is just a common understanding, so there's more tolerance in the common understanding of rough consensus, and I think that then helps the journalist to add their own perspective into it. So this idea of a, a more, um, you know, um, rough idea of consensus, a more uh, tolerant way of consensus making, I think is uh, really good in Asia to get collective action going. Can we have more questions, please? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what do you like to deal with? How do you deal with media that spread fake news? Mm -hmm. Right, so everybody is media now, right? If you have a mobile phone, you, you are the media, right? So. Um, um, as uh, I think it was McLuhan, right, that said, uh, "Don't hate the media, be the media." <coughs> so, so if uh, if we see uh, media like social media or popular YouTubers or so on uh, spreading uh, information that is mistaken, we we call out them on it. Of course, I think uh, the idea is not we we don't go to takedown in Taiwan. Takedown is something that is seen as a um, judicial branch thing. If uh, there is a really a infringement of um, you know copyright or whatever, there may be at the end result in the takedown after filing lawsuits and so on. But it's seen as a judicial thing, and we're in the administration, so we're not doing takedowns. What we're doing is what we call notice and public notice. So when people notice us that there is a disinformation going, you can see our premier, you know, uh, doing very funny pictures to call them out on it, or our president going on stand-up comedy, or our deputy premier going on a public you're live streaming, playing a video game, or things like that. So basically, we, we be, become media. We're not taking anything down from the administrative branch, but we deal with media by having our own um, social media and self-media going on in the government itself. But information is very powerful, Minister Audrey. And the government must have known that they hold power in yes, terms of, of spreading information. Have you found the case of state produce or sponsor mm -hmm. this information mm -hmm. campaign mm -hmm. to benefit the government. Mm -hmm. Right, so I think especially during elections, that's always a problem, right? Mm -hmm. Because when, um, for example, um, our president uh, now running for, for her second term, right? The, the separation between the judicial branch, which always have to be entirely impartial, 
and the administration, which of course need to explain what the president really has done in the past four years. This line need to be very clearly marked. And so if the government um, actually have any information in Taiwan's any institutional or social media that is directly or indirectly paid by the government, we have a law that says it has to say government advertisement on it so that people understand that this information comes from a government funding source. So when we uh, say in election, we have to ask everybody to declare their funding source in political propaganda and so on, we're not uh, holding a double standard. We hold ourselves to that standard, and now we're asking everybody else to the same standard. It means you really need strong and objective mm -hmm. judicial system, yes. the whole institution. Very much so, very much so. Yeah. yeah. Also, yeah, a what, question. what's next? Yes. How to raise public seriousness about this information disorder? Okay, so because I said people who raise uh, hand have uh, priority, uh, I, have, I, I have to be accountable to my words. So <laughs> uh, you, you can have my microphone. Oh, okay. Hi, sir. That's good. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, sorry. I don't want to be undemocratic and <laughs> grab it from the floor. But no, one thing I want to ask you about is I've read extensively that Taiwan is a major target of disinformation from mainland China. And also hard cyber attacks. It's, yeah. it's, it's not a secret. Yeah. So um, how would you quantify the disinformation threat from the mainland and how can you deal with it and how do you see it developing in the run-up to the next election? Okay, great question. So um, the reason why, of course, we have to pass the Political Campaign Advertisement Act is, of course, uh, even Facebook itself has disclosed that they receive massive amount of funding uh, from the PRC um, government uh, on um, you know those period of time, right? So it's not a secret. Everybody can analyze the, the money that they spent uh, during that uh, election period. And so I think the disclosure of honest advertisement is the direct response to that. Uh, we are, of course, also facing hard cyber attacks. It's not just disinformation, which is more on the content level and can be dealt with actually relatively uh, easily by the social sector. Hard cyber attacks is much harder to counter by the social sector alone. We really have to have a really good uh, I um, idea of where the cyber attacks comes from and a good relationship with white hat hackers. And so white hat hackers, uh, which is a, a terminology that's like a jargon, it's people who can uh, break into a system, but they tell you about it. Black hat hackers is people who break into a system, but they don't tell you about it. Uh, and so the white hat people are the most uh, treasured uh, information uh, workers in Taiwan. Uh, the president herself said that uh, uh, cybersecurity is national security, and we guarantee for all new government projects 5% to 7% of budget just for um, penetration testing and white hat hacker um, in empowerment. And so if you're a white hat hacker in Taiwan, you get paid really well. You get to meet with the president or digital minister quite frequently uh, and so that um, you don't fall to the dark side, which has cookies. And, and so a good relationship with white hat hackers is our answer uh, of being literally on the front line of cyber attacks. And that applies to a, a degree also to disinformation, but we emphasize more the social sector's role because uh, the requirement of training is less than hard cybersecurity, but it's very similar. I think the second question is quite crucial. Yes. How do you encourage public to participate in crowdsource mm -hmm. fact checking? Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, the, the key uh, to get people participating in any activity like that uh, are three. First, that it has to be easily actionable. Actionable meaning that you can only spend a couple seconds on upvoting or downvoting something. You can maybe spend just five seconds to flag something as disinformation. So making it really easy for people to participate and instant gratification, that is very important. Second is about connected. So when people do this uh, fact, checking, they don't do this alone. As I mentioned, the weekly meetups, the, the meetings with good food and drink and venue and things like that, making it a popular hobby of people to participate, that is also important, the environment. And the third thing is to make it extensible. Extensible means that people in social sector, when they do COFAX and things like that, everything is open source. So everybody can build another system that builds off on it. For example, there's another bot on, on the line system called Mei Yu Aunt, Mei Yu Yi. Mei 
maybe is another bot that you can invite to your chat rooms on the line system, and they see every message that everybody sent, but they forget about it. So there's no log, there's no analytic. It's all open source, you can check or set up yourself. But they compare every incoming message with a clarified uh, rumor on the COFAC database. And if it's already clarified, they just add saying, oh, it's clarified, it's not like that, and things like that. And so maybe it's really popular, because uh, then you can correct the mistakes that your friends uh, or families made without uh, hurting their face, right? If you correct them by yourself, they will hate you. But now it's just a bot correcting them, so it's better, I think. Uh, and so just more creative ways to make things extensible in addition of being actionable and connected. These are the three keys of public engagement. I got the signal. I'm so sorry. I got the signal that our time is yeah, up. But yeah, I just we're have at time. Yeah. two personal, not quite personal. Okay. The one is big, -personal. big technology <laughs> yeah. company like uh -huh. Facebook, Google, yes. Twitter. Uh -huh. They are part of spreading disinformation. Mm -hmm. What should be mm -hmm. mechanism by the government mm -hmm. or citizens in mm -hmm. general to have checks and balances mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, actually, the, the German uh, Nets DG uh, really helped us, right? Because uh, we talked to them. Um, and because all my uh, meetings are, are publicly transcribed, so you can actually find my talks uh, with people from Google and Line and Facebook um, on, on this particular meta. And uh, basically, we, what we were saying is that we think notice and public notice, we think a code of conduct is a better way, a multi-stakeholder way. Way. But please uh, implement it correctly. Otherwise, we may be forced to do something like an SDG that uh, force those media uh, social media companies to do the takedown and censorship by themselves. So don't force us to force you to force others on takedown, <laughs> right? Um, so so the so the. Because then they will incur a large amount of cost in just implementing the system. Uh, and so I think they see it as kind of a better alternative to participate in this best practice of digital accountability. Just a bit semi-personal. Okay. Do you enjoy being hacker uh -huh. or being minister? Which one is? I'm both. I'm both. Still? I, I'm, I'm both. <laughs> I, I'm still contributing on GitHub. Right? If you go, go to my GitHub account, I'm still coding. Right? I'm still maintaining the, the civic hacking project. So as I said, um, I'm working as a channel between the movements on one hand and the governments on the other hand. So I'm a kind of at a middle, at a Lagrange point between the two to make sure that people can culturally translate each other's ideas and voices in a way that fosters common understanding and common values. And we all know that Taiwan is the first country in Asia mm -hmm. to have same-sex Yeah, to have marriage. marriage equality, yes. And you are transgender yes, of course. minister. Yeah. Yes. Do you find uh -huh. having open source has uh -huh. also helped in terms of, of advocate people mm -hmm. to really support mm -hmm. any big cause or any mm -hmm. big issue like to support same-sex marriage? Yes, I think so. Having an open debate, a good petition system, uh, a system where everybody can see everybody's arguments, eventually led us to legalize marriage equality in a way that is very unique in the world. Uh, what we have legalized is that we have legalized the bylaws, that is to say the rights and duties and all the benefits of marriage, of performing marriage and being wed, but not of the in-laws. Uh, so basically, in, in Mandarin, we have 16 different words for aunt and uncle and things like that. And there's a specific chapter in the civil code that talks about uh, the, the re related parts of the in-laws. And these become kind of confusing to um, people who are more conservative uh, it, when after marriage equality um, you know, gets passed. So we have a hyperlink act uh, that says we enjoy all the marriage equality couples enjoy the, exactly the same status as uh, um, you know, heterosexual couples uh, for the bylaws, but we don't touch anything about the in-laws. And I think that is uh, the kind of rough consensus common understanding that across generations people can accept. And we're very happy to export it, for example, to Japan or to other jurisdictions which share a very similar civil code. One last final question. Okay. Is your IQ 118. No, no, that that that's that's actually a a, a mis mis that's that's misinformation. <laughs> uh, my, my my height is 180 centimeters. <laughs> 
<laughs> and, and and for adults uh, IQ, uh, the test uh, stops at 160. So so I don't know. I don't know what my IQ is. But I know that nowadays, if you have some apps on your phone and you're allowed to bring the phone to IQ test, everybody is 160. So <laughs> adult IQ is not important anymore. What's important is how we reach common understanding and common values. You are being modest. Yeah. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you so much. Digital minister yes. all day long. Thanks.